Hello, and welcome to another season of Weather Watch, Miller's University's exclusive weather entertainment program. I'm your host, Caitlin Westerholm. A lot has happened since we've seen you last, so let's get started by catching you up with your weather in 60 seconds. Gale force icy winds in Pyeongchang, South Korea, extreme flooding in Paris, France, and record-breaking warm temperatures in the eastern U.S. are all a part of your weather in 60 seconds. Home of the 2018 Winter Olympics, Pyeongchang, South Korea sits at the coldest location for its latitude, 37.3 degrees north. Games were postponed as below freezing temperatures and piercing winds to 50 miles per hour on February 14th jeopardized the safety of athletes and spectators. Just 18 months after reaching its highest level since 1982, the Seine River in Paris, France peaked at 19.2 feet on Monday, January 29th, after weeks of heavy rainfall. Nearly 1,500 people were evacuated from their homes, while another 1,500 were without power in the greater Paris region. Closer to home, summer-like temperatures broke records across the eastern U.S. this February. Washington, D.C., Newark, New Jersey, and Lancaster, PA were amongst a few that saw their earliest 80-degree days on Wednesday, February 21st, turning a new page in the history books. And that's your weather in 60 seconds. This past January, 28 Millersville students had the incredible opportunity to attend the annual American Meteorological Society Conference in Austin, Texas. Join us as we hear these students share their experience. This past January, 28 Millersville University students attended the 98th annual American Meteorological Society Conference in Austin, Texas. Uh, this year's theme was transforming communication in the weather, water, and climate enterprise, focusing on challenges within our sciences. This conference provided students the chance to network with new and established professionals, uh, present and absorb new research, and participate in various workshops and panels throughout the week. Let's hear from a few of our students. Hi, I'm Jan. This was my second National AMS conference, and what was cool was that I got to take uh, research that piqued my interest at the first AMS conference that I attended in Seattle and then turn that into uh, more research that I then presented in Austin, Texas. And so my research was a lightning correlation with weather parameters in Lancaster, Pennsylvania and I got to present that in poster form at the student conference. Hi, my name's Sarah and this is my first year attending the National AMS Conference and my favorite part about it is I got to network with a whole bunch of cool people and learn about new meteorology topics that I haven't thought of before and learn more about the field that I'm interested in which is broadcasting. Hi, my name's Dom. Last year I was fortunate enough to go to AMS in Seattle where I was pretty undecided with what I want to do in this field. Uh, so it was really nice to have had that experience because now that I do know what I want to do, I was able to tailor my experience with the various talks that we have at AMS uh, in Austin around the private sector. And uh, I really think that's important in terms of the decision process in the various aspects of meteorology. Um, so it's really important for an undergraduate student to get hands-on experience with things they don't know they, they might be interested in until they actually go to these talks and uh, get a little insight for them. As a first time attendee to the National AMS Conference, what made it special for me was making connections with professionals and students from across the country. If you ever get the chance to go, I highly recommend it. For me, the main takeaway of this conference is the great opportunity that you get to build these professional connections in a formal and informal environment throughout the entire conference. Gearing up for grad school this fall, I'm very appreciative to AMS for all the connections and experiences I've had these past two years. To all the undergraduate students who are contemplating whether or not they do want to go to a national conference, I can't recommend it enough. I, I can only say positive things about my experiences both last year and this year. So one of the great things about AMS is that you get to experience a new city. And since this year's was in Austin, Texas, uh, one of the things that they're known for is live music. So that's one of the things that attendees got to take advantage of while they were there was a really cool live music scene. 
So aside from enjoying the conference, I got to explore downtown Austin. My favorite part was checking out the Texas State Capitol and taking a walk down by the river with my fellow meteorology students. But if you're ever in Austin, be sure to check out that barbecue. It's clear that through this conference, students establish important connections within the field. Uh, we're exposed to a variety of sub-disciplines within meteorology and overall simply had a good time in Austin, Texas. Reporting for WeatherWatch, I'm student meteorologist Bob Capella. GO-16, previously known as GOZAR, is the first of the GOZAR series operated by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Since its launch over a year ago, the geostationary satellite has provided groundbreaking, high-resolution imagery and continues to revolutionize the vast field of meteorology. To learn more about the GO-16, Josh Marzak reports. A little over a year ago, NOAA, in collaboration with NASA, launched the GO-16, a satellite that's part of the Geostationary Operational Environmental Satellite Series. This satellite has revolutionized the way we look at weather from space by using a variety of state-of-the-art products and high-resolution imagery. But before we dig into the details of the GO-16, what is a geostationary satellite? There are two kinds of man-made satellites in the heavens above. One kind orbits the Earth once or twice a day, and the other kind is called a geostationary satellite, such as the GO-16, and is parked in a stationary position approximately 36,000 kilometers above the equator. In order to stay at its proper altitude, it's all about orbital velocity, the proper speed that creates a stable orbit based on its altitude. Over a year after its launch, the GO-16 became fully operational on December 18, 2017, replacing the GO-13 satellite. For the 15 months that it has been in orbit, the GO-16 has provided groundbreaking imagery due to the new products on board. Using a powerful new instrument called the Advanced Baseline Imager, GO-16 gathers imagery over the Western Hemisphere as frequently as every 30 seconds. This enables NOAA to gather data with three times more channels, four times better resolution, and five times faster than before. Faster, more accurate data means better observations of phenomena such as aerosols, fires, and severe storms seen during the 2017 hurricane season. But the ABI is not the only new instrument aboard this satellite. GO-16 is flying another powerful technology called the Geostationary Lightning Mapper. This instrument not only measures lightning that is striking the ground, but also lightning activity in the clouds that is charging the atmosphere. GLM will change the way forecasters look at severe weather and provide faster and more accurate warnings. Space weather is serious business in the 21st century as society continues to rely on sophisticated electronic systems. Working with other NOAA satellites, GO-16 observes space weather and collects information about radiation hazards from the sun that could harm communication systems and power utilities. To learn more about how the GO-16 has advanced weather forecasting, we sat down with Eric Hurst, Director of the Weather Information Center here at Millersville University. Uh, as an operational forecaster, the GO-16 is just an incredible tool. It's a huge upgrade from the satellite imagery we've had uh, in the past. And, you know, I think back uh, 35 years to when I started in forecasting and we got, you know, once hourly uh, printouts, like literally on photographic paper from uh, a satellite feed. And they were just fixed images, one an hour. Now we get images that can be taken as frequently as every minute uh, in, a, in a rapidly developing severe storm situation. You can literally see the clouds bubbling up before your eyes. Uh, and you're getting an updated image uh, every single minute. Now, the large uh, kind of continental scale or full disk images are taken less frequently, I believe every 15 minutes. But uh, they're very important for initializing computer models to provide uh, data for uh, you know, uh, areas that are, aren't populated, like over oceans where there's not any other weather data uh, other than the satellite view uh, offered. So, you know, uh, the GO-16 is a tool that helps uh, to um, get a lay of the playing field on the large scale, but then also allows you to drill down locally and see what is going on. Here in Pennsylvania, some of my favorite things uh, about GO-16 is the crisp details that you can see ac across the state. You know, Pennsylvania has a lot of different topography from the ridges and the valleys and the Susquehanna River Valley. And 
Uh, literally, you can look at it, uh, one of these high-resolution visible images, um, say on a summer morning, and you can see fog in the Susquehanna Valley, and then you can see thunderstorms initiate over the ridges of western Pennsylvania. And again, these images uh, typically are updated every few minutes. And so you can see things evolving during the morning hours and therefore issue a more uh, reliable forecast, say, during the midday and afternoon hours when perhaps uh, some showers or thunderstorms will form. Also, uh, in the winter, post-storm, on a clear day, you can see the snow cover just beautifully. You can see the, the snow-covered valleys, and you can see the ridge lines, and uh, even ice on the Susquehanna River in certain situations stands out on these high-resolution visible images. So it's uh, just a, a, an incredible tool, and uh, you know some of the images just are, are beautiful just to stare at and enjoy. Recently on March 1st, NOAA and NASA launched GOES-S, the second of four weather satellites in its series, and will soon be renamed GOES-17. The 15-year mission of GOES-16 and GOES-17, along with the future launches of GOES-T and GOES-U, will help extend satellite coverage until the year 2036. Weather is always changing, and it's important that we change too. Flying 36,000 kilometers above the Earth, the advanced technologies on the GO series of satellites are taking weather forecasting to new heights. Reporting for Weather Watch, I'm student meteorologist Josh Marzak. Thanks, Josh. Well, that concludes another episode of Weather Watch. Please be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. You can also visit our website, muweatherwatch.com, to view all of our previous episodes. As always, thanks for watching, and be sure to catch us next time on Weather Watch. Mm -hmm.